It is a teaching, a preaching that Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, Jörg, from Hour of the Truth, Juggler 66, do to prove to you that the New Testament is the infallible proof of Jesus Christ completely and perfectly fulfilling Daniel 70th week some 2,000 years ago. We spoke about that in many different terms. Uh, we came to the understanding and the teaching that the stoning of Stephen was the end time setting of the 70th week, you know, three and a half years Jesus Christ preached in the flesh. He went to the cross. He shed his blood for our sins. He confirmed the covenant with many in the one week and in the midst of the week he was cut off, but not for himself. He resurrected three days later. He poured out the spirit on the apostles and the spirit filled apostles continued the message that Jesus Christ gave the first three and a half years, the last three and a half years, only to the Jews. Because 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city, speaking of the Jews and the Jews only. The gospel went only to the Jews in the beginning, and it had an ending. That ending was recorded in Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen, and that is what we are going to read today. But first, let me warmly welcome Brother Tom Fress, who joins me again in this wonderful session today with Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk. Very happy to be here. I hope my voice holds out and, uh, and happy to be with the listeners, too, and uh, to read the precious, infallible recording of, of, of uh, the book of Acts, chapter 7, where we see uh, that Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Therefore, most importantly, Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, just as is predicted in Daniel's prophecy, by giving up his own life and becoming the Lamb of God and redeeming us all, putting an end of sin, making reconciliation for iniquity, bringing in everlasting righteousness, there is now no need for animal sacrifices or any other kind of sacrifice. As a matter of fact, he so thoroughly put away sacrifices that we can look out into the world, and if we see anyone, whether Jew 
or Roman Catholic or Protestant or evangelical <clears throat> making a sacrifice, then they have rejected the sacrifice that Jesus made, that one time all sufficient sacrifice for sin for all men for all time. They have rejected that sacrifice and they are yet in their sins. And their sacrifices, their lambs, their goats, their pigeons, and their doves will be the testimony against them when Christ returns. Because it is proof positive evidence that they have rejected the Lamb of God and made their own sacrifices. They are yet in their sins. They have compounded sin upon sin and they will reap the wrath of Almighty God when he returns. The 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled completely and perfectly by the Lamb of God. Anyone who suggests a future 70th week of Daniel has likewise rejected the Lamb of God and has now put their full faith and trust in a false Christ that will be revealed at the end of the, uh, near the end of the 70th and final week of this phony refulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And what is the most horrendous horror of all is that every one of our Protestant and evangelical priesters have been teaching this lie in this country for the last 250 years. And it isn't until now that the men of God of this country have come to realize that it's a diabolical lie to cause all of God's people to reject the Lamb of God, to, to worship him out of one side of their mouth and deny him out the other. Satan, by futurism, the idea that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, has made a laughing stock of the Protestant evangelical churches who prior to the beginning of the teaching of this phony futurist doctrine believed the historicist interpretation of the prophecies and that it was the papacy that caused this, that, that, that was the, the papacy was the man of sin, the son of perdition. Not a phony antichrist at the end of time, but an antichrist that would rule and reign over the kings of the earth and persecute the saints of Almighty God, wear out the saints of Almighty God, torment, butcher, in, inquest, crusades, and be persecuted and slain by the man of sin in Rome. We've been duped, we've been made fools of, and now it's time to repent of our ignorance and our stupidity and to repent of believing liars from the pulpits of our churches and restore the historicist understanding of Daniel's prophecy and true biblical Christianity. And when we do, the man of sin in Rome will quake in his boots. That's the only way to defeat the man of sin in Rome. Now, Acts chapter 7, more proof from the New Testament, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for your introduction here. Always very much needed that you put your thoughts in the beginning of our broadcasts and repeat here and there a little bit what it has been all about in the past and also to say what it is all about in the readings that we are going to do now. So I put today in a PDF, because that's easier for me to read because of the bigger letters in the PDF, I put the Acts chapter 7 uh, from the authorized version of the 1611 King James Version. So you will see that here and there this kind of a quote unquote old English that you're maybe not that much used to. And I just want to ask in the beginning already, before I even start reading, your forgiveness if here and there I maybe butcher a word. I am not an English native speaker. I am not that much used to these old English, especially not reading it out loud, because when I read the Bible, I read it quietly for myself most of the time. 
But anyway, it's about the message that will be taught to you, and that is very important. It says here, Daniel's 70th week, the countdown to the Messiah. Yeah? 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. It was a countdown. The people were supposed to know the coming of Jesus Christ. Quite different from our times today. Because Jesus Christ said not even uh, he knows or the angels know and no man knows the time of a second coming. But everybody was supposed to know the first coming of Christ. And Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 is to the day possible by, leading by, by, by being led by the Holy Spirit to understand when he comes. Now we are speaking about Acts chapter 7. And this is Stephen. This is one of the help us of the apostles I call him because he wasn't an apostle but he was chosen later to be part of the apostles to bring the word of God to the Jews and he went down to Samaria and he spoke to the Sanhedrin and this is recorded in Acts chapter 7 this is exactly what we are going to read and here next you have a picture that I looked up on the internet that is a little bit reflecting on what happened at that moment. I'm going to read the whole chapter to begin with and afterwards we will read it again and then discuss several verses of this. Yerk, may I interject a brief thought? Oh sure Tom, that's oh, where you're to, here for. To put, to put the listeners in the proper uh, frame of reference, remember Daniel's prophecy was, was unto the Jews only. And 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 it was it was for Daniel's people, the Jews, and Jerusalem. And at the end of that 490th year, the end of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, God instituted that there be one last hearing of the gospel before the Jews and Jerusalem. And it was given to Stephen to give the Jews and Jerusalem that last final hearing of the gospel. And after that, the end of that 70th week, after the end of this last final hearing by Stephen, after having rejected the testimony of Stephen, the last final hearing of the Jews and Jerusalem, the gospel would go to the Gentiles. You know, previously it was always said by Jesus, go not unto the way of the Gentiles. Why? Because the 70th week of Daniel was not yet over. Okay? That had to be offered first to the Jews. They had the option of receiving Jesus as their lamb. But they finally rejected it after Stephen's witness to them. And then it was okay to take the gospel to the Gentiles because the gospel was denied by the Jews. And God was not going to be left in the world without a witness. So the Jews finally rejecting him at the end of their final hearing by Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now we're going to hear the final witness of the gospel to the Jews and Jerusalem by Stephen. Thanks, Yerk. I hope this helped the listeners. I hope so too, Tom. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto, you, uh, unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon. And he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into, his la into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that this 
that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil before hundred, uh, 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all of his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph, and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen tholes. So Jacob went down into Egypt, and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sikkim and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sikkim. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children, to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up, and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, he, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as he strove, as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hands of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out 
after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness, forty years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord our, uh, your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned, and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, and it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus in the possession, <clears throat> into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David who found favor before God, and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Ye do, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did. So do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the Just One, of whom ye have been? now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Oops, I just wanted to change the picture here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not used to this computer yet, so this is the picture I wanted to have. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the young men's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. A very powerful chapter of the book of Acts. Indeed it is. And the very proof that even when Stephen <clears throat> recites the whole history of the nation of Israel of the last thousands of years, thousands of years to 
the Sanhedrin, even then they wouldn't acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ. Or maybe we can see it the other way around. When they saw that Jesus is the Christ and that they had crucified him, they stoned Stephen for giving them the message. I mean, they killed the messenger. They killed the messenger. Yeah, because, they, you know, they stoned they stoned Stephen to shut him up because they were completely convicted and completely convinced that they had slain their own Messiah. They wanted another Messiah. The Messiah that God sent them wasn't the kind of Messiah that they wanted. And yet they could not deny that he was their Messiah. Stephen was very convincing. Absolutely. He, he recited to them better than anyone on the Sanhedrin could the whole history of the Hebrew people. And he included Jesus as one of the prophets who the Israelites always stoned and always killed. And he finally convinced them. I'm, Stephen finally convinced the Sanhedrin that Jesus was the prophet of God and the Messiah of God whom they wickedly slew. And that they were found by Stephen and by the whole host of heaven to be just as guilty of all as all of those before them who did likewise and slew the prophets of Almighty God. They found themselves all of a sudden the object of God's wrath. And rather than confessing their sins and getting on their knees on the steps of the Sanhedrin, and begging God's forgiveness for having slain their own their own prophet, priest, and king, and Messiah, they stoned Stephen. They committed themselves to rejecting Jesus, not repenting and receiving him after the fact. They steadfastly stiff-neckedly denied the Christ that bought them. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are things in the Bible that my wicked flesh just can't seem to understand. And I confess my weakness to the listeners. In spite of what they were going to do to Stephen, Stephen prayed to the Father that their sin that they were about to commit to kill him by stoning, not be held against them. Incredible grace. Incredible grace. I'm not that perfect. But I give credit to Stephen for being as perfect as Christ was when he said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And that was the last, the final, the once and for all witness to the Jews and to Jerusalem of the gospel that began to be preached when Jesus was anointed in the River Jordan at the very beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel by John the Baptist. There were three witnesses, a voice from heaven, a dove that descended upon him. And it was the very, the very beginning of Messiah's ministry. If you had a stopwatch, you could click the start button. And seven years forward, seven full actual years forward, the final and 70th week of Daniel's prophecy was ended 
The stop button was pushed when they killed Stephen. And then and only then was the gospel to go to the Gentiles. As, as Yerk so brilliantly pointed out about a month ago or so, how do you know that the 70th week of Daniel is over? There's one positive, in, irrefutable fact visible in the earth that the 70th week of Daniel is over. No one can gainsay it. No one can deny it. All they can do is accept it. The 70th week of Daniel ended when the gospel went to the Gentiles. The Jews no longer carried the, gen the, the, the gospel to the world. The Jews were no longer the witness of Christ to the world, the witness of the God of heaven to the world. It was now the Gentiles. And that's where it remains today. Do the Gentiles now preach the gospel? To the Christ-denying Jews? To the gospel-denying Jews? If the Gentiles don't do it, it won't be done. There's no other witness in the world of the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the Gentile Christians who greedily accepted Jesus when the Jews denied him at the last final testimony by Stephen. You've got all these cockamamie false teachers all over this world in every Protestant and evangelical church, anywhere you can name. They preach a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. They don't have a clue, and they're no help to you. They are a stumbling block to you. And single-handedly, they have destroyed the Protestant Reformation. They have destroyed the truth. And they'll have you bowing down and worshiping a false messiah. That's the whole purpose of the futurist interpretation of Daniel's 70th week. If you believe in a future fulfillment, you have to deny the historical fulfillment which Jesus fulfilled as recorded perfectly and completely in the New Testament. And you are off to fantasy land where nothing is certain. Only you have uh, 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 speculation. That's the best you can say of futurism. You have nothing in which to believe but speculation. And that's why there's so much controversy and division and disagreement among all the prophecy teachers in this world. There's nothing certain. It's the blind leaving the, leading the blind. And they've led us all astray. And if it weren't for the mercy of Almighty God, we'd still be blind today. <clears throat> Why would you allow a futurist pastor to remain the leader of your Protestant and evangelical church? You have a responsibility to the one who died for you to put a true man of God behind the pulpit of your church. If you leave a futurist behind the pulpit of your church, you've got only one option remaining. And that is to kick the dust off your feet and leave that church and never set foot in it again. It's witchcraft what they're preaching from the churches today. You know what the Bible says about a witch? We are not to suffer a witch to live. Don't pay her. Don't darken her door. Don't ask her any questions. 
Don't ask her to divine answers to questions they can't even comprehend, much less answer. Suffer not a witch to live. That's what the scripture saith. Futurism is nothing but sorcery. It's, it's antichrist divination. Futurism and all of its teaching comes directly from the Roman Catholic Church under the guise of the Counter-Reformation. It was designed from the get-go by the Jesuits to be the once and for all lethal poison against the Protestant evangelicals who were leading people in droves out of the Antichrist Church of Rome. They, the Roman Catholic Church was bleeding arterially to the degree that if something wasn't done quickly, the Roman Catholic Church would shrivel into dust and blow away with the wind. There literally would not have been any Roman Catholic Church left if it, if it hadn't been for a last-ditch, all-out effort to find another interpretation of the prophecies that shifted the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy. And they came up with two alternative teachings, two alternative schools of Bible prophecy interpretation, one called preterism, the other called futurism. Both shift the blame, the onus, the accusation of Antichrist away from the papacy. If you believe in either the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy or the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, you cannot believe the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. If you believe in preterism, you think Nero was the Antichrist out of the old pagan Roman Empire. That can't be the Pope, can it? And if you believe in futurism, as every Protestant and evangelical church teaches today and has taught in this country for nearly 250 years, if you are a, if you are a non-Roman Catholic, and even a Roman Catholic uh, 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 Christian in this country, you most likely are an, a futurist, okay? It has become orthodoxy in the Christian world, this futurist belief. And if you oppose it, you're going to be resisted by everyone who calls himself a Christian. You're going to be called a heretic, a lunatic, a conspiracy theorist, wacko. You're going to be called every name in the book. But sticks and stones don't break my bones. May I insert something here, Tom? Sure. I think there's a very profound difference between preterism and futurism. Preterism is the denial that the papacy is the Antichrist because it puts the Antichrist in the past in the time of the pagan Roman Empire. But futurism is worse. It not only puts the Antichrist in an unforeseeable future, it also denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's right. In direct comparison, Futurism is an even greater abomination than preterism is. Certainly is. Absolutely. Now, I don't want to talk good of preterism in no way, shape, or form, but futurism no. is even worse because then you profess out of your mouth that Jesus is not the Christ, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's right. It denies that, G that Messiah has come in the flesh. That's what futurism does. And, and you know, every futurist is going to deny this, but anybody who's clear-headed and is not contaminated with futurism, which are, you know, like finding a needle in a haystack in this world. You understand exactly what I'm saying. If you're a futurist, you believe that Antichrist is going to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel. When in fact the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by the Messiah, that was Christ's literal mission for which he came to this world. The 70th week of Daniel is the act of our redemption. It is proof positive that Jesus was the Christ. 
If you say it's yet future, you've denied that Jesus was the Christ. You've denied that Messiah has come in the flesh, and that is the spirit of Antichrist as written in the, in the New Testament. And I, you, you just, I mean, it's almost incomprehensible that virtually every church in this land, every church that calls itself Christian in this country and around the world, preaches this antichrist interpretation of the 70th week of Daniel. Everybody's looking for a future fulfillment and denying the historical one. It's easy to preach the lie, Tom, when people do not know the truth. And people, well, do not know, people do not know the truth because they don't study the Bible for themselves anymore. When you compare the truth with a lie, the first thing that you are impressed with is that the truth is far easier to believe and makes far more sense. And when you hear it in comparison to the lie, you all of a sudden realize just how childish and ridiculous and impossible the lie is. Okay? Futurism is like a little boy who's told by his mother, now you stay out of the cookie jar. I'm going to the grocery store. You stay out of the cookie jar. Mom goes and does her, 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 her shopping, comes back with the groceries and asks her son, did you stay out of the cookie jar like I told you? The little boy shakes his head up and down and says, yes, with chocolate chips all over his face. Mother asks him again, did you do like I told you and stay out of the cookie jar? The little kid insists, Mommy, I didn't touch the cookie jar with chocolate chips all over his face. That's futurism. Okay, it's for childs. It's for children. It's a lying doctrine. It's immediately recognized as a lie. It makes no sense, no common sense, no spiritual sense, no prophetic sense. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And everyone who calls himself a pastor and a priester and a prophecy student believes the same lie. You can't find a historicist anywhere in this country anymore. They've never heard the term. I'm trying to impress upon the listeners that the churches are no refuge for you anymore. That they ought to be abandoned. You'll find more truth in the authorized King James Bible right in your living room with your friends and your family and the Holy Ghost in the middle than you'll ever find in any church. Even those that say they are spirit-filled churches that do miracles and prophesy. If they're full of the Holy Ghost, let me ask you this, all these charismatic and miracle-working churches, let me ask you this, if you're so full of the Holy Ghost, why isn't this Holy Ghost that you worship and obey ever told you the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Why has not your Holy Spirit told you this? You who think you speak in some heavenly language, the language of angels, why have not the angels told you through your, your gibberish that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist? Are you really full of the Holy Ghost or are you full of something else? Think about it. You who think you're so holy, 
you who say you possess the Holy Spirit because you have this ability to speak in this unintelligible gibberish, and as long as you can speak in this so-called angelic language, you can sin till the cows come home. And as long as you still have that gift, God has sanctioned your sin. That's why when you go to the television, you go to these televangelists that are knocking people over and waving their hands and barking like dogs and all this ridiculous antics. You ask yourself, why are they never convicted of their sin? Why don't they ever repent of this ridiculousness? This, this profane, holier-than-thou, miracle-working baloney? Why do they never repent? Why? Because they still speak in tongues. They think they've got God's sanction for all of their nonsense. And so they keep escalating the nonsense to the point where not even the charismatics can believe it anymore. It's a lie. You've been lied to. The Holy Spirit of Almighty God will never tell you anything contrary to the written word of God. Here's another secret. The Holy Ghost of Almighty God will neither add to the Scriptures nor take anything away from the Scriptures. Now, look at what you've been taught and believed. Is there anything in addition to the written Word of God? Is there anything taken away from the written Word of God by this so-called Holy Spirit that rules over you and your church? In the charismatic churches, the, the people in the pews have left off reading their Bibles and have gone head over heels for direct revelation from this so-called Holy Spirit that takes away from and adds to the Word of God. There's nothing holy about it. There's nothing holy about a spirit that supports you in your lying wonders. You have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You have blasphemed the name of Almighty God and put him in, in company with a lying spirit. Repent before it's too late. Repent of your futurism. Repent of your ecumenism. Repent of your phony spiritualism and return to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy and the written word of Almighty God, the authorized King James Version, 1611. You say you don't like the tone of my voice or the conviction in my spirit? Then stone me like they did all the prophets in the past. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm just adding here a few pictures of this charismatic movement, like here with Benny Hinn. That all people, all of a sudden, when they are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, they fall on the ground, whether they fall on their back or they fall on their face, whatever. It's just one big scam. Yeah, it really is one big scam. I don't know how people can fall for that. I mean, how indoctrinated have you? Do you have to be to understand that? or to, to, to get to come to the understanding that that really is the Holy Spirit. That is not the spirit that is spoken of in my Bible, and that is not the spirit spoken of in Tom's Bible, and we both adhere to the authorized version of the 1611 King James Bible. So I'd like to go back into Acts chapter 7 now and read uh, once again the verses and then see where uh, there's something that we can talk about to get even a deeper understanding of this chapter because as we said it is a very important chapter because with this chapter the 70th week of Daniel ended and that is so important to understand that the 70th week of Daniel is completely and utterly fulfilled by Jesus Christ in a part in his flesh until he went to the cross in the midst of the week and in another part in the spirit and as Tom said 
proof that the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled is that the gospel is with the Gentiles. Otherwise, there would not be Gentiles preaching Jesus today because they wouldn't know of Jesus. They didn't know of Jesus the first 4,000 years of this earth until Jesus came, which was about 4,000 years age of the, uh, of, of the earth. Anyway, let's go into this and I will keep this picture up here now that you really know that we are reading now of the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, of the finishing of the 70th week of Daniel prophecy. 490 years, 7 times 70, or 70 times 7. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he, speaking of Stephen, said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Here Stephen is talking about the faith that Abraham had. Because Abraham only left his country where he was born in because of faith. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So you get a history of the country where they are dwelling in even today. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession and to his seed after him, and as yet he had no child. This word seed appears oftentimes in the Bible, and it is very important that we understand that it is only speaking of one seed. It is not speaking of seeds, it speaks of seed. This seed is always uh, an interpretation of Jesus Christ. It starts already in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God says, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Seed always speaks of Jesus Christ and to his seed after him. The seed that comes out of this is the seed of Jesus Christ. It speaks of him, of Jesus Christ, the seed. It doesn't speak of the whole nation of Judah or the whole nation of Israel. It speaks of Jesus Christ here. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. So Stephen here gives a full history of how Israel, the nation state of Israel, at the first place came into existence by the seed that was given that was coming through Abraham and that seed eventually would become Jesus Christ and the patriarchs moved with envy sold Joseph into Egypt but God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, I personally think, Tom, and I would like to know your thoughts on this, that in this case, Joseph is a antitype, or, or, or I don't know if antitype is the right word, but a, a predecessor of Daniel. Because Joseph was made a man of power in Egypt, as Daniel was made a power made a man of power in Babylon, in the Babylonian captivity. Isn't that something that uh, gives a resemblance on Tom? 
Well, certainly that is something that Joseph and Daniel had in common. And uh, those who uh, have found favor with the Lord, the Lord has favored. And God was uh, with him, huh? Absolutely. God and, gave uh, him the understanding of uh, interpreting the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2, gave him the vision right. in chapter 7 of the four beasts that would rule this earth, Babylon, yep. Medo-Persia, Greece, and finally Rome. When Jesus came, he said, these are the last days because it was Rome already ruling the final yep. empire. I, I see a very big resemblance here between Joseph well, in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon. That's right. And Joseph, likewise, when he was in Egypt, was uh, embraced by the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made to be his second in command. And Joseph also had a dream. And he predicted seven years of, of plenty, an overwhelming harvest for seven years. And then after that, seven years of starvation. So because of the dream, the prophetic dream of Joseph, Pharaoh gave him charge over the matter. And Joseph, in those seven years, bought grain, all he could buy, and he stored it, and he kept it in reserve for the feasts, uh, for, the, for the days of famine. And when the famine came, there was plenty, and Joseph sold the grain and multiplied the riches of Pharaoh, and everybody had grain to eat, including his own family who had betrayed him, Joseph's family. And uh, all things work together for good them, to them that love the Lord and those who God has called according to his purpose. And certainly Joseph and Daniel were both called according to God's purpose. And that's why there's so much similarity between them. Yeah, I agree. So continue. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph, and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, Three score and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sikkim and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sikkim. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up, and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. <laughs> how God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Again, we have something that we can refer to in the time of where Stephen lives and speaks to the Sanhedrin, right? Right. God by his hand sent his only son to deliver them all unto righteousness. That's right. But they understood not. Yep. Their ears have been stopped up. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. 
and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did this, <clears throat> but he that did his neighbor wrong, thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at the saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at, that, uh, at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord unto him, Pull off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the, by the hands of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and the wilderness forty years. Jesus showed signs and wonders during his ministry in the flesh in the three and a half years, in the 70th week of Daniel too, right? He Certainly, healed the and he blind, was all... He healed the blind, he made the blind see, he raised the dead, he healed of uh, leprosy and of anything else. And the most important thing, I think, personally in this is, he didn't heal by laying on the hands and heal them, he healed by forgiving them of their sins. That's right. Just as Moses, uh, Jesus also came to be a ruler and a judge over Israel. And truly, and soon, he will fulfill that prophetic role. And uh, he came first to give them mercy. He came first to redeem them from their sins, to reconcile them for their iniquities. But they rejected him. Now he's returning to be their judge. He will judge them just like he judged Pharaoh and Egypt. Unless they repent of their cockamamie idea of building a temple and beginning animal sacrifices for which there is no salvation and receive the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that was offered to them 2,000 years ago, then they will die in their sins. There's no redemption when you deny the only salvation that's available. There is no sacrifice for those who reject the Lamb of Almighty God. And for those who accept the Lamb of Almighty God, there's no other sacrifice that can be made except one that rejects the sacrifice that Jesus made. <clears throat> Jesus caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. Now, if the 70th week of Daniel is supposed to be in the future. If that were true, all of Christianity would have died in their sins. All the Christians of history would die in their sins because Messiah fulfills the 70th week of Daniel. No one else can fulfill the 70th week of Daniel. 
No one else is commissioned to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel, but Messiah, the prince, the prince that shall come. Jesus, 2,000 years ago. If it's future, then Christianity had no hope for mankind for the last 2,000 years. Do you comprehend what I'm telling you? Look, you can't have it both ways. And there's only one way to have it. The historicist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. Historicism is the only correct way to interpret the prophecies of Daniel. If you're tempted to believe even a jot or a tittle of the future interpretation, you've denied the Christ that bought you. You have no redemption, and you will die in your sins. For 250 years, a quarter of a millennium, they've taught this futurist lie, which was conjured up not long after the Council of Trent. When the Council of Trent convened to damn Protestantism, to declare an all-out war of annihilation, spiritually and physically, against the Protestants. That's what the Council of Trent was. It was an open declaration of an all-out war of annihilation, physically and spiritually, against the Protestant re rebels, as they were known in the Roman Catholic Church. And the greatest weapon in their arsenal, the most successful weapon in their arsenal, the thermonuclear spiritual bomb in the Jesuit Council of Trent arsenal was futurism. And it was detonated in the Protestant seminaries in England in 1805 or 1810, somewhere thereabouts. And its lethal radiation has radiated this country from coast to coast, border to border, and all of Protestantism and evangelicalism all over the world. They all preach futurism. The exceptions are so few as not to even be mentionable. And we're all dying of a lethal dose of futurist radiation. And everybody thinks it's a joke. Well, let me tell you, the Council of Trent, the man of sin in charge of it, the Pope of Rome, and his weaponizers called the Jesuits, the shock troops of the Counter-Reformation, take full credit for having single-handedly destroyed the entire Protestant Reformation with one weapon, one bomb, futurism. Are we going to recover or are we going to submit to defeat? The answer was indicated by Vatican Council II in the 1960s when it was finally publicly stated by the Roman Catholic Church, by the papacy, by the general council held at the Vatican in, 19, in the 1960s, that the Protestants no longer believe that the Pope, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist because they believe the Antichrist is future. Therefore, they have abandoned their own Protestant Reformation. They have abandoned and destroyed their own foundation. They have proven themselves to be rebels against the authorized vicar of Christ on the earth, the papacy. And now they must make full restoration of the papal power that they destroyed 
when they rebelled. They must elevate the papacy to full kingly and priestly status in the church. They must obey his civil power. They must obey his spiritual power. They must repent of their Protestant rebellion and then make reparations to the church of Roman Catholicism. And that's exactly what we've been doing ever since 1965. And your Protestant pastors and evangelical pastors know it. And they're leading you back into the Roman Catholic Church. Let me give you one example how that's taking place. There's big talk and has been for a long time about who we should confess our sins to. Should we confess our sins to one another? Let me tell you, there is in the Roman Catholic Church and always has been the sacrament of penance. The sacrament of auricular confession where you confess your sins to a sin-sick priest. That's Roman Catholicism. And we're being brought back into that system. First step by degrees to return to the system of auricular confession is to increase all the talk that is going on right now about confessing our sins to one another. Knowing full well the chaos that will result from that, their already preser- uh, preserved answer for that chaos and conflict is to be then to confess your sins to the privacy of your Protestant and evangelical priest. Now we're off to the Roman Catholic Church races. Confession, auricular confession to the priest. It's happening right now all around you. All of this talk about public confession of our sins, confessing our faults and our sins one to another, is going to result ultimately, naturally, and by popular demand, private auricular confession of our sins to a Protestant, an apostate, Roman Catholic in disguise, Protestant and evangelical priester. You heard it here first. And they're going to return us to all seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, not just auricular confession. Already in the works, we're gradually and ever so slowly being being boiled like a toad to receive the mass of the Roman Catholic Church. Slowly but surely, in in the Protestant evangelical churches, we're being taught to call the communion table the Eucharist. And slowly but surely, we'll be talking about the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ now in the wafer and the and and the wine. The literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. The whole Christ, nothing nothing lacking, to be sacrificed once again on the altar. Now you've made a sacrifice. What does that mean, class? It means that you've rejected the only sacrifice that can save your sin. The one that Jesus made 2,000 years ago in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel. And you have eaten and drunk damnation to yourself in your Protestant and evangelical church. That's where it's heading. It's happening right now before your very eyes. And you heard it here first. Being a believer in the futurist lie, the greatest deception of God's people since the Garden of Eden, has tremendous spiritual consequences. And I've just named you two of them. There are five more to go. You're being boiled like a toad. The temperature is slowly being turned up and you can't even feel the heat. But at the last day, you'll find yourself worshiping the man of sin, the son of perdition, 
the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, and Jesus will then return and find what you're doing. You cannot trust any Protestant or evangelical pastor in this country or anywhere else in the world that preaches a futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It's the most dangerous minefield that you'll ever cross. But there's a simple escape. Just confess your sin before the Father. Ask him to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and put you on the straight and narrow path to redemption in Christ and him alone. Oh,